Hello guys and welcome. I am Ahmed Adel and this is Costa Engineering Professional. And in this video, we will be discussing nine secrets to become an unmatchable quantity surveyors. If this is your first time guys visiting our channel, please consider subscribing to the channel, turning on notifications, comment, like, share, show us love guys because we love you so much. And with this, let's get into the video. All right, guys, welcome back. Now, what this video is about. This video is about nine secrets or nine knowledge areas that you should master in order to become a very good quantity surveyor and secure a, a good position in a company. And most of the people are asking why some of the quantity surveyors are getting $1,000 uh, salary or even less, and some others are getting five and 10 and $20,000 salary, while both of them are having the same designation or uh, job title which is quantity surveyor and in this video i'll be showing you exactly why and what are the skills that you need to acquire in order to be a successful and strong quantity surveyor so let's start the first secret or the first skill or knowledge area is learn how to measure quantities from the drawings and wait before you close this video and say this guy is saying or speaking about nonsense just Think for, about it for a while. The designation is called quantity surveyor. You should be able to measure quantities, guys. So decide, first of all, decide which takeoff tool are you going to use? Because if you are still using AutoCAD until now, with all respect to AutoCAD, AutoCAD is not a takeoff tool or a takeoff software. AutoCAD is a drafting software, okay? So you need to choose a takeoff tool like PlanSwift or CostX or Bluebeam or anything, something that gives you the, the power to be very fast and very accurate when it comes to quantity takeoff and measuring the quantities from drawings. Okay, so this is a very important part. The part number two is learn how to measure each item in the BOQ. Now you have a project and how many items do we have in the project? So much guys, so many items. Some of them are measured, which will take us to point number three. Some of them are measured in numbers, linear meters, square meters, cubic meters, item, provisional sum, and all this. You have to, to, you need to know how to measure the item from the drawing and what is the unit of measurement of each item in the project. So this is the first secret, learn how to measure quantities from drawing. Work seriously on that, guys. If you take like one day to, to like quantify a 1 million job or 500,000 uh, let's say dollars job then uh, like you need to understand very fast that you lack something here and you need to improve here in this area okay secret number two learn how to develop project scope and how to prepare a boq and what does that mean now someone can come and throw some drawings at you and say please give me the estimate give me the, the price of the project or give me at least a quantified boq but you shouldn't be asking him what are the items that I should measure. You should know. You should tell people that in order for these drawings to become something real, in order to execute these drawings, we will do one, two, three, four, five items, whatever items are there. And this is how you define the scope of the project. And you go and measure each of these items in the uh, proper unit of measurement that this item should be measured in. So the first thing we can say here is that you need to know the BOQ divisions. The BOQ has many divisions, guys. And if, if the nature of project is similar, so a BOQ from a previous project might be very helpful to you. You can just follow the same, but you need to be careful if there are some missing items, you need to add them to this BOQ. But it will be starting from the preliminaries, then you will have the site works, concrete works, masonry works, metal works, wood works, thermal moisture protection, finishes, doors and windows, external works, mechanical, electrical and provisional sums and all these stuff, accessories. So you need to know, first of all, the BOQ divisions. Then inside each division, guys, you need to understand what are the items that will come inside each of these divisions so that you can measure them and don't miss any items. Point number three here, read the drawings carefully and don't miss any items in the BOQ, we discussed this. Now imagine you have done a BOQ and maybe you did the cost estimation or someone else did the cost estimation and 
you uh, just followed the, the BOQ that you uh, prepared or the cost estimator followed the BOQ that you just prepared and one item is missing there. So simply it will not be priced, just it will not be priced. So if, if your contract is lump sum, you will execute this item from your pocket. So this is a very important part here, guys. Read the drawings carefully, identify the scope of work carefully and add each and every item to the BOQ. And some of the tenders, when the uh, tender documents are issued to you as a contracting company, they uh, one of the contract documents is, is BOQ and most of the time it will be quantified BOQ or maybe only item only BOQ and you need to put the quantities, rates and amounts. If one item is, mi is missing there, it will not be priced and if the contract is lump sum, you will execute it from your pocket. Be very careful about this guys, this is so much important. Uh, point number four here is to learn about prime cost items and point number five is to learn about provisional sum items. So the, the PC item and the, the PC and the PS, let's start with the PC. For example, let's speak about supply of flooring tiles. This is a lump sum item. It's, a, it's an item inside your BOQ which is part of your lump sum contract. But what is the supply rate of the tile? There should be a selection. The client or the project owner should select this specific item. So select means what he need to go and choose the model number from the, the specific supplier or the specific vendor. So such information will not be available at the time of making the tender. So some PC rate should be there, like let's say 10, 20, 30, whatever currency you are using per square meter for the supply only of this material. But uh, installation of the of this material and all the associated materials that will be required for example in the case of tiles so you will need sand you will need cement mortar and you will need grouting spacers all, all these things are included in your uh, rate but a part of your rate is the pc or the supply rate of the tiles so just read about the pc items guys understand how to deal with them what is a pc adjustment so that you can deal with them later on when the project uh, starts or during the execution of the project and we will be discussing this uh, in a moment. Now provisional sum items. Some items will be a provisional sum when there is some kind of uncertainty about the item. Let's say the elevators for example or the swimming pool. You will just keep a, an amount of let's say 100,000 or whatever currency you are using. You will just keep an amount to execute this item but maybe there is no design uh, for for the swimming pool yet maybe there is no design for the elevator yet whatever the uh, provisional sum item and there will be some uh, additional item to the rate that you will specify for the provisional sum and this will be a percentage from the amount of the provisional sum and this percentage will be for the contractor attendance overheads and profits so we need to know what is pc and what is PS, we don't need to miss anything in the BOQ, guys. We need to understand each item in the BOQ. We need to know the BOQ divisions in order to be able to do the knowledge area or the secret number two, which is develop project scope and how to prepare a BOQ. Okay, secret number three, learn detailed cost estimation. And <laughs> actually, guys, this is, uh, this is where you start becoming uh, more experienced, uh, more expert in what you are doing, when you leave the level of being only a quantity surveyor who will be only doing the takeoffs, busy with uh, what is the quantity, unit of measurement, BOQ, this is where you start to enhance your skills, develop, grow up a little bit and become a cost estimator. So first of all, you need to understand the difference between cost and the price. If I am a contractor, guys, if, if I am going to execute some item, of course, I will encounter some costs to execute this item. So these are my costs. But how much I will sell this to my client? This will be my price. But the price that I am giving to my client is his cost. So the difference between cost and the price has to be very well understood when we are talking about detailed cost estimate. Number two, the basis of estimate. When you are preparing an estimate, guys, you need to have some list of assumptions. What are your assumptions that based on these assumptions, you have driven your final 
estimate whether it is cost price cost or price of the project so this the cost or the price is driven based on some assumptions that you have made for example the productivities one mason how many meters of uh, square meters of let's say block walls a mason can do per day so this is a this is an assumption you will assume that he can do eight ten whatever productivity that you will put you have assumed that but are you sure that at sight this mason will do eight square meters of block no there is not there is no uh, certainty about it but from your historical data from your discussions with the project managers for example in your company you will get to to to, to make to prepare the, the the basis of the basis of estimate and the list of your assumptions the prices of materials all these things will come under the basis of estimate now rate breakdown analysis which will take us to the cost elements guys the cost elements we have for each and every item in the boq we have a material cost we have equipment or tools cost we have manpower and we have also subcontractor cost so cost elements for each and every item in the boq is a very important knowledge area that we should know when we are doing a detailed cost estimation then the allowances and the margins are things that are added to your cost estimate at the end you will estimate the cost then you will allow for the things that you have not allowed for while you were doing the cost estimate and you will add the margins to your estimate to come up with your price and this is very much linked to the item number one here learn the difference between cost and price so the margins are contingencies overheads and profit okay knowledge area number four or secret number four learn about contracts and we have two points here actually the first one is the pre-contract works the, co the, the the works that you can do or that the tasks that will be required from you before the contract is awarded to your company and what are these when when you receive a tender and you submit your bidding and you are awarded with the project now you need to sign an agreement a contract with your client in order to start the works and the, the works will be executed in accordance with this contract so before you sign a contract guys you need to go through the contract clauses and maybe you will not go through all of them and maybe the the form of contract used is not a standard form of contract like fidic or anything else maybe it is just a contract drafted particularly for this job or maybe it's fidic red book or whatever anyway you need to go through the contract clauses read them understand them because some obligations will be there guys and these obligations might have a cost impact like for example if you are required to submit uh, let's say um, performance bond in the form of bank guarantee okay in order for the bank to give you a bank guarantee they will charge you something and you have not allowed for that so basically you are doing that from your pocket because as per the contract your performance bond is in the form of bank guarantee so the the premium that the bank will charge me for issuing me a bank guarantee in order to give it to my client as a, a let's say a performance bond this premium should be allowed for in my estimate it should be included in my price so i'm just giving you an example of where the contract closes might affect your pricing guys and uh, other than that regarding the contract closes you need to pay a very good attention to the termination clause how the client can terminate this contract you need to be very much aware of the situation or the cases that you are giving to your client that in these cases the client has the the opportunity or he can terminate the contract and you need to read them very well and be very uh, much aware about what is there so that uh, you you know your rights and you know what is for you what is on you and we need also to look at the terms of payment uh, is there is any advance payment what is the percentage of advance payment here this is the performance bond that we discussed just now and regarding the terms of payment also is there is an advance payment what is the percentage of the advance payment uh, they are giving to give an advance payment against what is it against a security check or again another bank guarantee that i have to allow for its premium in my uh, let's say in my price or something and then how they will recover this advance payment and here we need to also look at the retention okay 
what is the percentage of the of the retention and when the retention will be released most of the time they put 10% and they release 5% upon completion and 5% after one year which is end of defect liability period so you need to be looking at this as well and uh, again regarding the contract clauses that we should pay uh, close attention to you might consider uh, looking into the dispute resolution how how if in case of dispute how it will be resolved is it due uh, is it uh, in courts or is it uh, like uh, alternative dispute resolution like arbitration how how the contract uh, speaks or or how what will be done in case of dispute as per the dispute resolution clause so these things they are not very detailed you don't need to be a contract manager in order to do that guys these are very simple things and they just need some practice so this is a very important skill that you should have in order to be a wonderful quantity surveyor so let's go to point number five now learn about contracts but post contract works now you have quantified the project you have priced the project you have reviewed the contract you have signed a contract and now the project is ongoing you will execute the works now so as a quantity surveyor what you should be able to do what are the knowledge areas what are the things that you should know while the project is ongoing you need to know how to do the payments and payments you need to know how to do your payments how to prepare your payment application to your client in order for him to certify your payments and you need also to review and certify the payments of your subcontractors to you so the the payments uh, is a very important part and uh, actually the majority of the quantity surveyors are working in the payments like 90 percent of the time and this is where i say wrong 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 guys wrong a quantity surveyor need to know all these things not only payments where you sit on an excel sheet previous current total and that's it i am a quantity surveyor no 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 this is if you want to grow if you want to grow you need to like leave that guys payments are important i understand but it is not the only thing that a quantity surveyor is made for no quantity surveying is much much more bigger than that second and third points variations and claims like both of them somehow uh, connected but the variations in is when when there is some additional works or some cost saving from your contract so you need to refer back to your contract what your contract says and how these deductions or additions will be made such actually when we were discussing the pre-contract works i should have said this you should also check the clause of variation and the pc and ps adjustments how these should be made before you enter into an agreement but since you are already in agreement now so you will do the variations and the claims as per the contract actually claims will have some part which is more related to planning engineering and not quantity surveying which is time uh, delay analysis and this stuff but if the planner will prepare the delay analysis at least you can like refer to your rights as per the contract and assist uh, the the claim consultancy or whoever you will hire to do this or maybe even you will do it yourself this will be your part related to claims then other cost related tasks where the project manager will be asking you tell me how much is the cost of manpower of the project of a specific item till date and how much did we price for that he might ask you to calculate the quantity to order some tiles or some block or so concrete or steel bar bending schedule all these things guys are responsibilities of a quantity surveyor and you should be very much aware about these things in order to be able to work in a project in post contract okay so this that's it about uh, item number five sure there are so many things that you can do while you are uh, on a project full time but i just wanted to highlight these very important points and this is uh, knowledge area or secret number five now going to secret number six learn about procurement and some of you guys have been watching me for a while and i come i speak about quantity surveying cost estimation cost engineering and this stuff and so many people ask me like what is your current rule or what are you doing now guys actually guys my full-time job now is about procurement and what i want to say here about procurement not because i am doing procurement full-time procurement guys is where you combine each and every knowledge area that you know and even every skill that you know 
and knowledge area will be combined into one place to do this, to do the procurement, guys. Because first of all, you need to prepare the request for proposals that you will send to your subcontractors or to your vendors or whoever to start getting the prices. And then what is the scope of work? Because when you receive the quotations, these quotations should be as per the request for proposal that you have sent and you need to make sure that the subcontractor or the vendor or whoever has priced exactly as per what you need from him. Nothing less, nothing more to avoid any problems with this particular vendor or subcontractor in the future. Then types of subcontract agreements like, guys, are we going to do it lump sum? Is it going to be remeasured? Is it just supply and install? Is it supply only? So if supply only, we will go for purchase orders. If it is supply and installations, then maybe remeasured or lump sum or whatever uh, agreement that you will be using. And what is the difference between agreement and uh, purchase order? This purchase order will be for ordering materials. But when labor are involved, when there is a supply uh, installation factor here and there is some liability over the works then you will need to go for a contract because you will have clauses and everything these might be prepared by contracts people but still you as a quantity surveyor working in procurement department you should be uh, like monitoring looking at the subcontract agreements looking at uh, the, the terms of payment there and the, the bonds and all the things that we have discussed in the pre-contract works because in that case you will be working in pre-contract and you will be uh, like negotiating the price, closing, discussing the scope of work. Sometimes the quantities will not be there. You need to quantify. Sometimes before you even float the inquiry to the market, you need to do a cost estimate to, to like prepare yourself, prepare your management to show them that the price will be approximately around this figure. So don't be shocked when we receive the prices from the subcontractors. So you see, guys, you are combining each and every knowledge, you know, quantity surveying, estimation and contracts. And even you need some personal skills, like you need to know how to negotiate it with a subcontractor, discuss the scope of work. And so this is where you can like uh, uh, release your full potential. You can do all, you can practice all your quantity surveying skills here when you are working in procurement. Wonderful uh like uh, knowledge area i love it so much and this is our secret number six here learn procurement guys learn procurement guys learn procurement guys okay let's go to secret number seven learn about time and the quality not only cost yes if you are a quantity surveyor and you will be spending 99.99% uh, of your time doing cost related stuff or tasks okay this is where you start becoming like, a, I don't know how to describe it, but you need to start going out of the cost area and start like entering the time and the quality areas as well. Why? Because time and the quality guys, both of these things, they have cost. Okay. So if you are completely ignoring these two parts and what are the like impacts that can happen due to time and the quality, you need to understand what is the impacts of time and the quality on your cost. If the project delays, if a subcontractor delays the works, if a vendor delays the delivery, what will be the cost impact in that case so you can make a choice or you can take a decision or help your management to take a decision. So in order to do that, you don't need to be a planning engineer, but you need to have a good understanding, a good knowledge about planning and the scheduling, about the relationships between the activities, finish to start, to start to start, to start to finish, finish to start, and all these things. You need to know what is a cash flow, how to distribute your BOQ over a time schedule and get your S curve and all these things. This is a skill that you should have, of course. Difference between quality and the grade. Some subcontractor will come to you, especially when you are doing the procurement, and he will say, our price is high because we have high quality. And you will tell him, actually, what is the definition of quality? Quality is the degree of conformance to project specifications. So I am not asking you to give me something extra. You are actually, your price is high, not because you have a higher quality product. It's a higher grade product, which I have not asked for. Please follow the project specifications. 
So you need to know what is the difference between quality and the grade in order to be able to negotiate better and in order to only not focus on cost. We have some other things that we should be looking into. Now, what is the cost of quality, cost of conformance, cost of non-conformance, such things you should be able to uh, calculate. And the definition of quality we just said, which is the uh, conformance, the degree of conformance to project requirements or specifications or whatever. If I need uh, like uh, a Toyota Corolla and someone gives me Toyota Corolla, that's very good. But if he comes and tries to give me very expensive Mercedes, then he is giving me a higher grade. I didn't ask for that. The Corolla is, 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 a, is a good quality product for me because this is what I have asked for actually. So it's, it's just like that, guys. Now, secret number eight, learn cost control and earn value management. And what is cost control, guys? You will have your internal cash flow and you just need to monitor every month, are we meeting this or not? And what is the earned value, which is the percentage of work completed? The earned value metrics, which we have a, a, a video here on our channel. Maybe I link it somewhere here uh, around the video where we have discussed this on actually all of these in, in, in deep detail. It's like a 50 minutes video. So uh, I leave a link just to not make this uh, video very long. But cost control and value, extremely important. You will be the QS who is in the project. They will not hire a cost engineer and the quantity surveyor and the planning engineer. This will be too much costs to load on one project. So the majority of the time, the cost control tasks will be dropped on the quantity surveyor. And in my opinion, as a good quantity surveyor, you should be able to do that. Now, the last one, secret number nine. I love this, guys, because as you know, uh, I am an associate of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. And actually, in order to become an associate of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, you have to pass an exam and you have to take one course. And this course is introduction to alternative dispute resolution. What, what introduction means? It means that you just need to know what are the, the, the methods of uh, dispute, alternative dispute resolution, like arbitration, mediation, conciliation, negotiation, expert, expert determination, private judge, mini trial, and there are so many others. Just all you have to do is to know like how each of these methods is being practiced and is the outcome binding or not and stuff like that. So this is a very good knowledge area, guys. And some people are doing the alternative dispute resolution or claim consultancy services and this stuff full time. And it's a very good uh, field by itself. But as a good, strong, knowledgeable quantity surveyor, you should know this. You should know at least what is the meaning of each of these. And you also need to understand the, the outcome, is it binding or not, how to practice them so that um, you can have a, a good understanding about uh, alternative dispute resolution. That's it, guys. And these are our secrets, our uh, great uh, nine knowledge areas, or let's call them secrets because they, they really are secrets. When these nine skills are combined together, guys, really, you become, if you start, you will start to feel it. Like you sit in any meeting or any discussion or you sit with a vendor, even you, see, you attend a meeting at the site, you speak to the client, to the consultant, even to, the, to your project manager, you will understand the power behind this commercial knowledge. Actually, in my opinion, who has the commercial knowledge uh, is able to, to, to sit in any meeting and speak very confidently. Why? Because you know everything uh, inside out. When you talk money, guys, the, the speak becomes heavy because everyone is worried when it comes to money. And also when you know contracts, when you know dispute resolution, when you know time, productivities, cost control, then you can sit in any meeting very confidently and discuss the matters, reply to the questions, give your opinions, and people will listen to you. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. And uh, if you did, please uh, like, comment, share. You know I love you guys, so please... Uh, support our content so that we can continue and with this see you guys in the next video take care stay safe